It's my honor and privilege tonight to introduce Mr. David Straub, who is currently serving as the inaugural Sejong LS Fellow at the Sejong Institute, an independent and non-partisan Korean private policy think tank. David was a Korean diplomat serving with the State Department for 30 years, from 1976 to 2006. He also served at the American Embassy in Korea for eight years and also headed the Korean Affairs Desk at the State Department in Washington, D.C. for several years. He, while serving uh, with the U.S. Embassy, he has witnessed, he had witnessed many turbulent political and social events in Korea, including assassination of President Park and also Gwangju uprising uh, or incident. After retirement, he briefly taught at Johns Hopkins and also Seoul National University. He also was associated with the um, Stanford University Schoenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. Uh, he authored uh, a book called Anti-Americanism in Democratizing South Korea, uh, published by Stanford University. The copies, both in English and Korean uh, version, are available for sales uh, in the back. Yeah. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, David Straub with a big round of applause. I'd like to thank Brother Anthony and uh, Tom Coyner and Yonju Hong and everyone at uh, the Royal Asiatic Society for making this possible. These things take a lot of work. Uh, and so we, we owe, not all of us owe them a uh, debt of gratitude. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming out here. I can see this is a rowdy group. Uh, <laughs> but my goodness, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful fall evening outside here in Seoul, and I was tempted myself when I was walking with Brother Anthony and Mr. John back from dinner just to stay out of here on the patio and with a drink and enjoy the evening, but so uh, thank you very much for your interest uh, in Korea. Um, and I would also like to say it's a great uh, honor and privilege to, to lecture at the Royal Asiatic Society in Korea branch. It has a terrific uh, uh, history. Uh, so many uh, brilliant people have stood here, and, and so it makes me feel very small, uh, and, but also very grateful. Um, so, anti-Americanism in South Korea. Uh, for those of you who lived here a long time continuously, you may have a notion of it. For those of you, how many of you have not been here more than five years, the last five years? Yeah, so, Quite a few, but most people have extensive experience. So, so many of you have had uh, saw some of this uh, firsthand. Um, but uh, let me tell you just a, a little bit more about myself, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, as Mr. Jones said, I, I I came here as a second tour State Department officer in 1979. I, I was 25 years old. I studied a year of Korean and at the State Department School just outside of Washington, D.C. I, I didn't know anything about anything uh, and was just discovering how difficult the Korean language was and things like that. And then all hell broke loose here. Uh, uh, Park was assassinated just up the street. Um, Tundawan began taking over as a general. Uh, then we had the terrible events. In, oh, we had massive protests in the spring of 1980, and then the Kwangju the, the problems, and then Chun taking over completely. Uh, so that was quite an education for me, and I became fascinated by Korea. Um, I continued to work at the embassy a couple of years in the political section, and I was uh, the person who went around and talked with the so-called uh, J.I. Inside, that is, the politicians who were forced out by President Chun. Uh, I also dealt with the student movement and some of the religious organizations that were active in, um, in the democratization movement. Um, 
by the time I left in 1984 on a new assignment, I was really fatigued because at that time, uh, Chen Duan was very unpopular. And as the person who was seeing people who disliked Chen most, every time I met a Korean, the argument was, the United States is all powerful in Korea, omniscient in Korea, and therefore everything that's wrong with Korea is at least partly your fault. So, I sympathized with that argument quite a bit initially, but after two years non-stop of hearing it, you know, it became a little less persuasive uh, to me. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so that brings me to the next time I came to work in Korea, which is the subject of this evening. After 15 years, I had recuperated. <laughs> I was ready to come back and try it again. Meanwhile, Korea had democratized, so there'd be no more of these difficulties, you know, with everyone blaming the United States for all of these bad things happening. And, uh, and I came as the head of the political section, which is a pretty nice gig at the American Embassy. You have the ambassador, then you have the number two, the deputy chief of mission, and then you have, in those days, I got, what, four or five branches, uh, political section, admin section, economic section, consular section, and the public affairs. So, uh, and uh, political affairs is not really that much about following Korean political affairs. It's dealing with the foreign ministry, dealing with the Ministry of Defense uh, and, and uh, the U.S. Forces Korea, and some of the following political parties. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting job. And when I came, the uh, Opinion polls showed that Korean popular feeling toward the United States was uh, as high as it had ever been. And so I was looking forward to a nice, easy, fun, you know, uh, cookie pushing uh, three years in Korea. Um, it was not to be, as I will tell you <laughs> a little bit more in a minute. Um, so uh, during the period I was here, um, we had lots of demonstrations and lots of anger against the United States. And uh, it was pretty traumatic for me because I was in a position that had to really work on this with the Korean government, Korean media, U.S. forces Korea, and, and, and others. Um, and it was, it was very difficult. And in many ways, I felt it, was, uh, it was, didn't make sense to me and it was kind of unfair. So when I finished up my tour in 2002, I said, I've got to write a book about this because there's an American point of view about this that the Koreans have not heard. Because during this period, the Koreans were talking among themselves about you know, all of these terrible things U.S. forces Korea or the Americans in general were doing. And uh, we, an American view was really not heard here. So I thought I could write a little bit about that. But I was still in the State Department. And so I was busy, and it's kind of awkward to write books like this when you're still in the State Department. So I finally left the State Department in 2006 and said, now I'll write my book. But you know, uh, for those of you who've worked in government, uh, especially if you know the State Department, we're trained to write to busy bosses upstairs. So one page, no more. So I spent 25 or 30 years doing nothing but slices, cutting back on my own prose, and then when I was more senior and I was an editor, I would cut back on everybody else's. I got really good at, at removing adjectives and all sorts of verbiage. So when it came to write a book, 200 pages or something, I had a physical revulsion against writing that long, because I could have made the argument, you know, in 10 pages, if I had the same purpose. But this is sort of quasi-academic, it's uh, you write by the pound. So it took me years and years just to overcome that. I finally, when, by the time I had missed my deadline for several years and I was going to lose my job and embarrass everybody involved, I, I, and I, this is my last chance. So I sat down and wrote it about three weeks. And then, of course, I had to rewrite it and stuff. But I, it, it was, I wrote it fairly quickly, uh, initially. Uh, and so that's why a book about anti-Americanism in Korea comes out in 2015 at a time when, again, uh, the Koreans are among the most pro-American <laughs> in the world. Because after I left, maybe because I left, they, <laughs> they went, you know, and things went way up. Uh, so uh, it, 
made me wonder why I got into trouble. Um, but anyway, I, I did write it, and, and people helped me to get it published. And then um, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for, for our Korean publisher. Sun Chiram was a very distinguished uh, Korean publisher, and we have uh, uh, Sun Chiram's uh, representative, uh, Yang Yunmi, is here. Yun Yang Mi. Is Yun Yang Mi here? Yes. Please give a round of applause to somebody who works very hard. And she's done, it's, it's done a beautiful job, the cover is great, uh, the translation is excellent, and, and uh, just so I'm very, very grateful to Miss Yu. Um, and also, she gave it a really good title. The title, Anti-Americanism and Democratizing South Korea, is probably in the running for the worst title ever for a book, <laughs> but I was, it was imposed upon me, the Korean title is much, much more active. Uh, so tonight, what I'm going to do is tell you a, a little bit about what's in the book um, and some of my experiences and thoughts about uh, anti-American feeling in South Korea. Um, and since many of you have lived here much longer than I have, and, and during periods especially when I was not here, I'm really looking forward to the discussion, so I'll try to speak fairly briefly so we can have more discussion tonight. Um, and I, to put this in context, uh, I think this, uh, this subject fits in very well with a couple of recent briefings we've had on, on current and contemporary Korean history. We had Michael Green talking about minshim or popular feeling, and this is quite closely related to this. In fact, he talked about a few of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight as well. And then uh, we had Dr. David Fields who came and talked about his research uh, about the um, 1882 U.S. Treaty Normalizing Relations with, or Establishing Relations with, uh, with Korea and, and Dr. Seaman Rhee and his activities and how that inadvertently contributed to the division of Korea. Um, so th this fits together with them somehow. Okay, but uh, let's, uh, I will try to make this fairly brief uh, and, and make it a little bit interactive at the risk of causing trouble for our videographer. But uh, I, have, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but basically I'm just going to use it to get things kicked off. Um, Um, 
the uh, Korean man apparently was deranged. Um, he said that uh, David had said something derogatory to him, maybe he was homeless or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, he, he killed him, um, he died right away. And there were about, there was one young wire story about that big. Uh, it was a great story. It said, uh, quoted uh, the deranged man as saying that, well, he said bad things to me, that's why I attacked him, as if that were credible. Didn't say, didn't quote his uh, friends who said he never said a word to him. And there was not another word in Korea about this. Not another word. Now, I wouldn't mention this if it was just a deranged man. But as we know from the United States and other countries, deranged people are deeply affected by the culture in which they live. I have very little doubt that the man who killed him was affected by all the anti-Americanism in the media and, and on the streets during this period that had begun in 1999. Yet, Americans paid no attention to this. Koreans certainly paid no attention to this. A, uh, I, I've introduced a term in the book called asymmetry of attention. Uh, by that I mean the symmetry of public attention to the U.S. ROK alliance. South Koreans know and are interested a lot in the United States and the U.S. ROK alliance. Far fewer Americans know about uh, Korea and, and very few Americans are, you know, know very much or very interested in, in the workings of the alliance. So, this person was basically, his death was basically ignored. It didn't, essentially for Koreans, it didn't happen. How many of you know this fellow? <laughs> Everybody, right? Uh, this, this is uh, Sai uh, from Gangnam Style. Okay? How many of you know what this is all about? Several. So this was Psy in 2002 after the girls were killed by something that well it didn't look like that, but was not it was a tank a track vehicle. Um, there was so much anger in South Korea at the United States over that incident and other things that went before it that Psy, a young entertainer on the make. He uh, got on stage and did a skit in which, you know, the Americans are running over Koreans with tanks. Now, how many of you are familiar with this? Several, yeah. This is, uh, this came out, uh, uh, or Sai sang this at a concert in 2004, two years after all of these events, when the anti-American feelings were dying down here. This is pretty rough stuff. This is in response partially to the Iraqs. Of course, uh, I don't know, when, when did Kangnam Style become a big hit? Anyway, uh, much, later. When, much, much, later. much later. And he was really big in the United States and all over the world. And you know, he was coming to the States and feeling great. And then somebody went back and found this. <laughs> and his PR people went nuts. And they quickly put out an apology, an apology saying, you know, if I offended anybody, and I only did this because it was in the middle of, you know, everybody was upset about the rock. So uh, he, he was going to move quickly, and, and he did. Okay. Uh, how many of you remember the controversy over President Kim's first meeting with President Bush? Most, many of you, most of you. Okay. Uh, you may remember that uh, the two men, Kim, President Kim had gone to North Korea for the first ever and only North, at the time North-South Korean summit. He came back saying at peace is at hand. He won a Nobel Prize. And then George W. Bush was elected uh, in, uh, what is it, the end of 2000. And President Kim knows that President Bush is, is kind of hostile towards North Korea, so he wants to go and persuade him to support his sunshine policy. So he rushes there, and, and just a couple of months after Bush is elected, in March, and they have a meeting. And Bush listens to him politely enough, but he doesn't agree with his North Korea policy because President Bush, frankly, doesn't believe it makes sense. President Bush, in once referring to President Kim, uh, said this man. 
which after a day or so suddenly became a huge thing in Korea because people started saying this man is Haram <laughs> which <laughs> is literally this person but in Korea it has a very negative connotation uh, so this became a very big deal and if you talk with uh, with Korean friends and colleagues to this day and even if they're at think tanks or whatever you talk to them they'll say you know Bush, Bush, uh, Bush uh, really went too far to get me calling a president this man <laughs> now how many of you um, believe that in say calling President Kim this man that pres that was reflecting uh, President Bush's feelings, true feelings toward President Kim, uh, and that it, those were disrespectful. Please, your frank opinions. Most South Koreans would say yes. <laughs> Everyone is afraid. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> this I, I told you it made Koreans very upset. So very famous Korean politician. Is he still in the assembly? Anyway, he's, uh, he's been around for a long time. Very distinguished looking gentleman. He was vice speaker then. Uh, he sent a letter. He said he was going to send a letter to Bush, and I think he did, uh, uh, condemning him for that blunt gesture of calling President Kim this man. And Mr. Holmes said he had checked with close American friends, and uh, they, they told him that he had such a term Verges on the casual. <laughs> and my friend uh, Mike Chinoy, who many of you know, used to be CNN's East Asia correspondent, very uh, nice person, sharp, uh, uh, great journalist, uh, a scholar. Uh, he wrote uh, this book uh, called Meltdown uh, about North Korea policy and differences between the U.S. and South Korea. And this is a paragraph from his book. He says, Bush started off the press conference by referring to Kim Dae-jung as this man, a casual reference. Possibly, this is, these are my uh, bold face, possibly indicating he had forgotten Kim's name and chose not to refer to his title, which South Korean sound offensive. And years later, when I, Mike Chinoy, interviewed Kim Dae-jung, the memory still rankled. He humiliated me by calling me this man. So I think that's after Kim stepped down from the presidency. He's still, as an old man, is still uh, angry about this. Now, here is what President Bush said in context. And by the way, I'm not here to defend President Bush. I left the government because of President Bush. <laughs> I, I did not like him at all uh, as president, or, and I did not like most of his foreign policy. So I'm not here to defend it. I'm here because I'm, I'm hoping just a little bit to help correct the historical record. So President Bush said, everybody in? <laughs> it's been my honor to welcome President Kim here in the Oval Office. We had a very good discussion. We confirmed a close relation and so on and so forth. Um, how much I appreciate this man's leadership in terms of reaching out to the North Koreans. He is a, he is a leader. <laughs> I don't know if I sound like Bill Clinton or George Bush. Uh, so he says, you know, frankly, somewhere here he says, frankly, that, uh, you know, I'm a little skeptical about North Korea. But anyway, um, but that's not going to preclude us. He actually used the word preclude uh, from trying to achieve the common objectives. Okay, now, so you see what the context is. Uh, so, um, now, is this use of this man offensive? So, I'm going to try, let's see. Just click on it. Just click on it. Okay, is it casual? You may want to use the mouse. Uh, mouse, okay. I'm... <coughs> now, I just, I just pulled this off the internet just because of the language. This, I have no idea who this wonderful couple is. And do you, this is the truth, take this back? <laughs> okay. Now, I put in book, when I married my Korean bride, we had a marriage here, a ceremony, then we went a couple months later, as many people do, and did one again in the States, the family there. The minister there 
said the same thing to me. And I hope my wife was not thinking, you said, oh. <laughs> what does it humiliate? Now, how many of you know uh, this fellow who just recently was forced out of the White House? Gorka, who's... Uh, uh, <laughs> so he really loves Trump, right? He was forced out of Trump's White House, but he says Trump is the stuff. And out, uh, he's going to... Uh, He's going to help Trump more on the outside than he did when he was there. So he's having this argument with this journalist who really wants to go after him. And I think it's... And Sebastian Gorka joins us now live from... ...to the Make America... He didn't lift a finger to... ...unstoppable. The fact that we have entrenched interests for decades in this city is just a reality that we're going to deal with. It's not a contradiction. You're saying he's not in control. And that the people around him are pushed out, that the, the great supporters like you and Steve Bannon, yeah, you're saying he's unstoppable. He's clearly stop it's, he clearly is stoppable because people like you have been pushed out. Not at all. This is going to be an eight-year presidency, and we're only in the eighth month. I mean, do, are you really so facile in your understanding of politics that you think the MAGA agenda is going to take eight months to realize? Well, you're the one who's saying it's being undermined, and the people who are against it are in the ascendant. No, I'm saying that the, you're not listening. I said the MAGA agenda inside the building. My apologies, I misread my boxed out. time But that's just here. part of it. I mean, you do anyway, know how many people voted for the he, He's talking about Trump, and he said, I'm going to... I'm going to help this man on the outside. That's how our democracy and our... You can trust me on that. Now, uh, uh, finally, this is my coup de grace. Remember when Joe Biden, Uncle Joe, decided he was not going to run for president last year, and uh, he kept everybody in suspense, and finally he, he says, I'm going to give a speech telling you what I'm going to do. And he comes out and he spends 45 minutes saying what I would have done had I run for president. And uh, again, let me see. So at the very end, my, my apologies, folks, for not being. Anyway, at the very end, this is what Joe Biden says. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work with this man, Obama, standing right there. So I guarantee you, if you go out tomorrow and you talk to your Korean colleagues and you say, tell me about the, this man, nine out of ten of them, maybe 99 out of 100, will say, Bush personally disrespected Kim Dae-jung and humiliated. I give this because it's, it, this is a, a great illustration of the fact that there's not enough balance in the public relationship between the American side of the alliance and the Korean side of the alliance. Koreans focus on the U.S. much more than Americans focus on Korea. And therefore, most of the talk that the Koreans have about the alliance is among Koreans themselves. And so Koreans are not native American, uh, English speakers. And so if this man is Yi Saram, it's fairly natural that people think, oh, this is problematic. But if there were a lot more dialogue going on, that would not have, that one would not have been sustained. Um, and we have lots of other examples. I'll give you a few more during this talk. So my book um, has this table of contents. Um, I have basically an introductory chapter and a concluding chapter. Um, the introductory chapter sets the stage. I try to talk a little bit about the history of U.S.-Korean relationships, a little bit about the origins of anti-Americanism. Um, and then at the end, or I should say that these chapters in the middle are all case studies of controversial issues in the U.S.-ROK alliance <coughs> during this period that I worked here. 1999 to 2002. And the final chapter tries to tie all that together, gives my interpretation of, of why these incidents happened the way they did, and speculates a little bit about 
whether we might have more anti-Americanism in South Korea in the future. So it, it's fairly simple in that regard. Um, but what am I talking about when I say anti-Americanism? Well, uh, unlike the PhD students here, like Jacob and others, uh, I'm not forced to define terms. And I looked, and you know, there's no agreed definition of what anti-Americanism is. I know it when I see it, and people often disagree. So I just basically uh, said, for want of, of uh, anything better, that if, if, if this group of people or this people in uh, this state uh, treat another state or people of that state different than they would others in the same circumstances, and negatively so, then that's kind of anti, that was good enough for my purposes. Um, one of the very interesting things that I've found, and I'm sure many of you too have found, is that you'll find very, very few Koreans, uh, even then, who would be willing to say, oh, I'm anti-American. They would say, no, no, I'm not anti-American. I'm just critical of American policies. You, you, you guys have terrible policies, but I'm not anti-American. What it reminds me of is nothing so much as in the United States, there are there's a significant percentage of Americans who are racist. And yet today in the United States, being racist is politically taboo. Uh, you, you, and people have internalized that. You'll find almost no Americans who would, who would uh, not only would be willing to say, would even believe in their heart of hearts that they're racist. No. They say, I'm not racist. I just believe that white people should work just as hard as we do if they expect, you know, to, 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 to live there and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's, it's similar to that, and you'll find very sophisticated Koreans, even to this day, who say about periods like 1990 and 2002, no, no, I'm not anti-American. You guys were just being awful. You, you were treating us awful. But if the Americans maybe weren't really treating Koreans awful, and Koreans were treating the Americans as if they were treating them awful, there's some prejudice and, and anti in that, in my opinion. Now, the other thing about the content of my book is I, you know, I focus on one specific kind of anti-Americanism. And that's because of, of where I was at at the time at the American Embassy. So I was focused on um, the anti-Americanism that centered around the alliance relationship itself. I mean, you could like in every other country, you'll, you'll be able to find Koreans who say, I think American popular culture is just horrible or... Uh, I had uh, one of our members here works for a brilliant Korean man who's worked on the front lines of, of U.S.-Korean relations for decades, and he took me very kindly, he read my book, and very kindly took me to lunch and said, uh, yeah, it's okay, but really anti-Americanism in Korea is all about the economy. If you look at opinion polls, uh, Koreans are always more interested uh, in uh, the economy and trade relations than they are anything else, including in presidential elections. And if you look at the things that Koreans over the decades have been most angry at the United States about, uh, at a basic level, it's been U.S. trade policy. You know, anytime the U.S. has been tough on Korea on trade, uh, it's made Koreans really mad. And, and he has a point. Opinion polls uh, do show something like that. But, you know, maybe it's just because I, I have never worked on economic issues um, and because that's fairly common all over the world. That, that, didn't really interest me, and I, I, I maybe I downplay it too much, but I think the really more important strain of anti-Americanism in Korea is, is uh, historical and ideologically based. And it centers around uh, South Koreans' concept of, the, of their own country, the establishment of the Republic of Korea as a divided state, um, and how to look on North Korea and how to look on the United States and other quote unquote quote, quote unquote great powers, and uh, that that I think is is the nub of it uh, that's important for the alliance. Um, so, as I said in chapter one, uh, I talk a little bit about the history and the setting for this period, 1999 to 2002, um, and you know what most of you, even those of you who've been here not so long, you've read about the history of, of Korea. Uh, and, and seen a lot of the world. So you know that over the past hundred years, especially in earlier decades, 
Um, there was a great deal of Western racism against Koreans. Uh, the Koreans have every right to, to, to have been very upset about that. Um, Korea was also a victim of great powers. And uh, I don't think they were as much a victim of the United States as a great power, as many imagine. Um, but they certainly were of Japan and, and, uh, and the competition Japan had with Russia and China. So Koreans still have a sense of being victims. Um, Koreans, at least until recently, also had a very, very strong sense of ethnic nationalism. When I first came to Korea, and, and you know, or maybe just before I came, and, and heard Daniel Ninjo, uh, you know, single uh, race nation or something, um, as a liberal in a sense, that bothered me a great deal. Um, and uh, it was, it seemed to me as an American whale at the top, even though I could understand it as a defensive mechanism uh, because of all that the South Koreans had suffered in the previous century. Um, I'm happy to see that that is much, much reduced in Korea over the past 10, 15 years. But uh, as recently as 10 years ago, it had not disappeared. Uh, all of you remember in 2007, uh, the uh, student at Virginia Tech, Jo Sun Hee. Um, I mean, a terribly sad case. We've seen scores of cases like that in the United States. Essentially, uh, a mentally ill young person with access to guns. It's uh, an American ailment. And uh, he killed, I don't know what it was, a couple dozen people or so. It was just horrible. And I happened to be back in Korea at the time at, at Seoul National University teaching one quarter or one semester. And there, for those of you who were here, you'll remember, Koreans were terrified that Americans on the street were going to go out and kill Koreans in the United States. The, uh, they thought that uh, Koreans would stop getting visas at the American Embassy in retaliation. They thought that, I think the FTA was either signed or, anyway, would, something with the FTA would not go forward. Um, the then Korean ambassador to Washington seriously proposed that uh, Korean Americans do a fast a day, every day or something for all the people who were killed. <laughs> Uh, the president of South Korea got on the phone, I believe it was, and called the president of the United States to apologize. And I kept telling my Korean friends, Americans are not going to think like that. And we've had too many of these cases. We know because this boy grew up in the United States. He's not Korean. He had Korean citizenship. He hadn't gotten American citizenship. But culturally, he was an American. And he's mentally ill. So I kept telling my wife, and, and I have a little anecdote, a footnote in this book, you know. I went with my, my, my wife's uh, high school classmate, her husband, took us on a long trip over to the East Coast, uh, beautiful. And uh, my wife and friends started saying, oh, you, you Americans going to kill us all. And I said, no, 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 no it's not, not, nobody's going to get killed. That's not the way Americans think about this. And I, I said, I ruined a perfectly good weekend because, <laughs> because of the thought. But, uh, Gradually, over the next week or two, nothing happened in the United States. And gradually, the Korean media picked up and said, uh -huh. some, some said, we were wrong. Maybe we were ascribing the way we look at ethnic nationalism to the Americans. And maybe not everybody in the world looks at things the same way that we do. And a few said in the media, maybe that helps to explain some of our reaction in 2002, after the, the girls were killed. I looked briefly at some of the historical reasons for um, anti-Americanism. Um, you know, there are arguments that the U.S. was uh, responsible for not stopping Japan from colonizing Korea and other things that really quite, I won't get at those tonight, uh, but uh, are, are quite misguided. Uh, they don't really understand the world situation or the role of the United States at that time. Um, Kwangju is much different, and we had, I think, Michael Green talk some about Kwangju. Kwangju had a big effect on the younger, now 40, 50 year olds in Korea. Um, when they were young people and saw the things that happened as Chandu won to power and, and uh, as many people killed in Kwangju, and there was this very widespread perception. 
that the United States uh, could have stopped Chen Duan from coming to power, could have stopped things in Guangzhou, which I, I, we can talk about it more if we want to, but having been in the embassy as a very junior officer at the time, uh, it, it's just nonsense. The United States was not in Korea to be the sovereign over the Korean government. The American ambassador and the American military commander viewed their role as doing everything possible to prevent North Korea from attacking South Korea again. And we now know, this was 1979, 1980, we know now that around 1975, Kim Il-sung, as Vietnam was falling, went again to Beijing and said, I'd like to try the Korean War again. And fortunately, by this time, the Chinese had, had actually, unlike Kim, had learned something. He said, no, we're not going to help you do this. So this is four years before the North Koreans are still ready to attack South Korea and invade it. So that's what the Americans were focused on. And they were going to you know, insert themselves into Korea and try to become, in fact, the sovereign in Korea. So this brings us up to my arrival in Korea um, in 1999. And as I said, the polls were good, and things were looking fine um, in U.S.-Korean relation terms. And then, just entirely coincidentally, in the fall of 1999, um, AP, a wire service, read a story about uh, American soldiers killing a lot of South Koreans in the first few days of the Korean War at a place called No Win Ni. Um, and it's a horrible story. Uh, exactly what happened is not clear, and we'll never know because it's lost in the fog of war and so forth. Um, but it was terrible. And there were some other incidents in which uh, civilians were killed, especially by bombers uh, and things like that, and, but almost all in the first weeks and months of the war. But <clears throat> this had a tremendous impact in South Korea. Um, it, to me, and this is my interpretation, I may be wrong, but I'm not sure that we would have had the terrific uh, surge in anti-Americanism that we had for the next three years if that had not been there as a catalyst. Because the headlines that this story generated, the columns and the commentaries, were, head, were entitled something like, What Does America Really Mean to Us? So this was a reinterpretation of the USROK Alliance and of the United States, especially by the younger generation, the 386 generation uh, affected by Kwang Ju and their interpretation of that. And that um, But there was another thing that happened, which was uh, it, at the end of 1997, Kim Dae-jung was elected president. And Don Kirk, who's back here, has written a really good book about Kim Dae-jung that everybody uh, should read. Um, and uh, he very uh, insightfully notes that Kim Dae-jung's focus was on this North Korea thing. He really wasn't very interested in security issues or the alliance. His real focus was on North Korea. And he was supported very much by people on the left. And when he came to power, those people on the left, for the very first time in ROK history, felt uh, empowered. And his government also helped finance these, uh, some of these left-wing NGOs, some of which were quite anti-American, some of which were clearly hoping to help uh, forced the U.S. forces off the Korean Peninsula. And so they became very, very active uh, at this period. Uh, and also, the South Korean uh, journalists, the reporting people, the people of younger age, they were quite critical of the United States. Uh, and so they took uh, no uh and what it meant to Koreans about the United States, and they ran with it. So over the next three years, we had one big controversy after another about the United States, most involving U.S. forces Korea. Um, and these are not nearly all of them. I just put the more interesting ones or some that I was involved with. Uh, all of these are involved with U.S. forces Korea, except this one, which was the controversy between President Kim and President No on the one hand and President Bush on the other. And this one was about the Apollo Ono short track controversy. Supporting the thing. Okay? Um, 
just to give you just a flavor of a few of these. Um, in chapter 3, formaldehyde acid. How many of you have heard of the movie uh, The Host, or in Korean Kremo? Yes. That's about that incident, or it's, you know, based on it. It's a fantasy story. Um, the head of the mortuary down at uh, USFK, um, Gung-ho guy, he found some old bottles of formaldehyde used in embalming. It was no longer uh, useful, it was dusty. He told his Korean staff, uh, dump that stuff down the drain, we don't need it anymore, let's clean this place up. Now in, the, in those days, on the backs of formaldehyde, it said they'd be diluted in water and disposed of in the drain. Uh, but those were old bottles. By that time, South Korean regulations didn't allow that way of disposing of it, nor did USFK regulations. So one or more of his disgruntled employees went to one of these left-wing NGOs and they had a big announcement. And the headlines were, the Americans are poisoning our water. They are trying to kill us. Huge story. Now, the fact of the matter is, shouldn't have happened. It's a violation of not only Korean law, but also USFK regulation. And he was punished somewhat for it. Um, but it was not a threat to the health of people. Because it is, once it does dissolve in water, especially in any amount, is not dangerous. And by the way, same USFK personnel also drank the same water to people who sold were drinking, okay? So if it's a problem, okay, but it's not going to kill you. Uh, and by the way, the Americans were as, as exposed as you were too. Didn't make any difference. And every time the Americans tried to explain the argument that uh, the, the Korean media and the NGOs would say, you're trying to kill us, and you have this, you're shameless enough to say, to try to make excuses for it? How dare you? And that was as far as we ever got. <laughs> so this was the environment that, that the embassy and USFK had to deal with over the two years in terms of, of the public relations with um, I, I'll tell you one more anecdote about this one. Um, I was so frustrated because, you know, I couldn't always feel that USFK was giving me a straight story, and I certainly didn't believe the Korean media, and I knew the Korean media would not allow other voices or not, other people who were scientific experts in Korea were frightened to say, no, it's not that bad. So you saw almost no stories in the Korean media saying, don't worry, it's okay. You did later, three or four years ago, uh, after that, when Korean companies dumped tons of this stuff in the water, <laughs> They said, it's okay, it's okay, it's diluted. So I'm trying to figure out how bad is this? You know, is it really serious for health? So the internet was not very useful in those days. So finally, I got in the yellow pages, and I, uh, there was a, I should say, there was a, a chosen Yilbo, a pro-American conservative newspaper's editorial said, would the Americans dump formaldehyde in the Potomac River? So I called a coroner who worked near the Potomac River. <laughs> And I said, you don't know me, but you know I work here, and this is the situation, and I need you to tell me, frankly, what do Americans do? do you, how do you dispose of this formaldehyde? And the guy obviously didn't know me from Adam and didn't know what I was about. But finally said, well, yeah, sometimes we'll throw a little in the drain, with, but dilute it well. <laughs> so yes, we do. Dispose of it in the Potomac River, chosen your uh, Kuni Range. That's where we had a bombing range uh, uh, near the village of Mehangi over the Yellow Sea. Uh, the activist down there who was trying to get the US to stop using that as a bombing range around his village was, well, I better not say it in public. But anyway, he, uh, there, there was an incident in which uh, an American plane was having uh, mechanical difficulties in following standard operating procedures, the pilot, for safety reasons, dropped six live bombs on the far side of the island. Now, the island is about a mile and a half or two miles off the coast. So, for any of you who have been in the military, you know the idea that that could cause any damage to the village two miles away is just nuts. And yet, this activist came out and said hundreds of old people were injured and uh, cows miscarried and we had hundreds of houses had cracks in uh, the foundations and the windows all broke. And the Korean media reported that without any questioning. It's stunning. I, I give many, many quotes in the book. 
And so they said, you have to have, a, the editorial said, you have to have a joint investigation, this must end. So we had a joint USF game, MND, Ministry of National Defense Investigation. And sure enough, this is zero damage from this. This is just ridiculous. <coughs> so <clears throat> the head of the American side, who's a, a hard headed fighter pilot, Major General Mike Dunn, and he said, well, to his colleague, the Korean general, said, well, we know what we put in the report. And no damage in the Korean general said, but if we say that, I know it's the case, but if we say that, we're just going to be killed. Well, we have to, you know, phrase it nicely and, 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 and allow that there may be some damage. I don't know what he said, but it's probably something along those lines. But done, you know, as a straight shooter, he said, no, I'm not going to put my signature on that. So they gave the report just as they had found it. And the Korean media was furious because they had been going on for weeks that, you know, this terrible thing had happened and the Americans were shameless. And they said, okay, you, you guys, you Americans, you just don't get it. It's not just what you did this time. It's what you've been doing to us for the last 30 years. <coughs> That's a hard argument to beat. Okay, uh, so far, uh, I'm not going to have time to, to talk about it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we need to finish up in a little bit. Uh, SOFA is a really, really important issue, probably less important now uh, than it was then. Uh, if you're one of those people who believe that the U.S.-Korea SOFA is fundamentally unfair to the, the, the Korea or the Korean people, I, I hope you look at the book sometime to see my argument that it's not. Um, I've already talked a little bit about the disagreement between the two governments over North Korea policy, which had some impact on anti-Americanism, but I don't think it was all that much, because um, as time went by, Koreans became more and more skeptical of the Sunshine Policy themselves. Chapter 6 is about the short track racing scandal, or controversy. And by the way, this chapter was written by, not by me, this is the only chapter I did not write. When I was at Seoul National University in 2007, uh, one of my students uh, at the graduate school there, John Slack, an American, wrote this beautiful paper about this. And I thought, this would, uh, since I don't know anything about sports, much less uh, short track racing, this would be great to show another angle. Um, so uh, with, with just small changes, we put his paper in this book. And uh, I learned a great deal from it. And unless you're a, a real sports fan, uh, you, you will learn something too. Basically, Koreans had not won anything in Winter Olympics until uh, short track was put in, uh, in, in as, a, as a regular Winter Olympic sports, and the Koreans went great guns. You know, they were, they were going up to the top in the top ten because of this. And then this a Japanese American kid named Apollo Ono, uh, you know, was involved in a disputed call, and uh, Korean sports fans in particular uh, went nuts about it. And if, if, if I put it in here uh, because it's an important issue. It had a huge impact on the way Koreans looked at the United States. They were incredibly angry. Um, the cyber attacks were launched on numerous U.S. media and other organizations by South Koreans over this. There were at least 40 death threats issued by uh, Koreans against Apollo Ono and so on and so forth. Big deal. And a very interesting episode. And the, con the, the final uh, case study is about this terrible uh, uh, traffic accident that, that killed the two girls. Um, I, uh, I put in the book, but I, uh, I remember very vividly, I was working in the office there on the eighth floor of the embassy, and I got a phone call from Evans Revere, who was the number two at the time. And Evans apparently had just got a phone call from U.S. Forces Korea saying this accident happened. He told me. I said, oh, how horrible, how sad. And he, and he said, this is going to be terrible. This is going to be awful. And I said, oh, surely not. I mean, I mean, it's a horrible thing, but it was an accident. It's not like, uh, you know, that, that terrible uh, rape uh, of a little schoolgirl in Okinawa some years before, something like that. Uh, no, he said, this is going to be terrible. Uh, and basically what happened is within the first day, the American Embassy and the USF Forces Korea started issuing apologies, 
uh, compensation money to the family. Uh, we had candlelight church services. Uh, U.S. forces regular personnel both earned a lot of money, gave of their own money to, to give donations to the family. This all happened in the first 24 hours, the first couple of weeks. Koreans were not paying attention. This was when the 2002 uh, uh, World Cup soccer course of Japan and Korea was on, and Koreans, you know, the Red Devils were great, and it was great fun, and everybody was completely focused on this. As soon as that ended, the media and some of these NGOs became focused on this, and they paid no attention to the fact that we'd already done all of the things that they started demanding that we do. And any time we made new apologies or anything else, that we, any other gestures we made, that was, no, it's insincere. We don't believe it. Uh, and so this went on. Um, we had a court martial for the, the two men uh, to see if they were negligent. The, the verdict was not guilty. Of course, the Korean media, as one, including the conservative so-called pro-American media, said, ah, we knew it. These are Americans trying Americans who killed Koreans. Of course they don't give a damn about it. And so, the last couple of months, we had huge demonstrations. <clears throat> and in the background was the South Korean presidential election. And uh, Noel McGon was the progressive candidate. He was famously anti-American, had called for the withdrawal of U.S. forces Korea 10 years before. Uh, basically, he didn't say anything. He didn't participate in the candlelight protest. He didn't have to. Everybody assumed they knew what his position was. But the conservative pro-American candidate, Lee Jung Hee, uh, became uh, so fearful that he was going to lose, and rightfully so, that he called in the American ambassador in front of all the media and did this really offensive, obnoxious browbeating of the American ambassador over this issue. But he still lost. 49 to 47%, 2% difference. And in opinion polls, 20% of Koreans said that their vote was affected by this traffic accident. 11% said concerns about North Korea affected their vote. So it may very well have been that this traffic accident caused no gun to be elected uh, at that time. And then it was over. Within two or three weeks after no was elected, the protest stopped. And there are many reasons for that. But primarily, I think the storyline had reached an end. You know, for three years, Korean media have been going after the United States. Um, that's a long time. If you remember, the campaign against Japan ended at the end of 2015 with the agreement between Park, uh, with uh, President Park. It had been going on for at least three years. And uh, that's a long time. So people get bored of that kind of storyline. And in this case, the story had an ending. And the happy ending was, the progressive, the anti-American, no Khan, had won. And partly because we Koreans uh, self uh, righteously went out on the streets and told the Americans that we won't take this any longer. And then President No, even before he was inaugurated, his focus was on North Korea. He really wanted to uh, take up the uh, sunshine policy and make progress in North-South relations. He didn't want problems with the United States. He wanted George W. Bush to support, or at least not oppose, his North Korea policy. And so he went down to USFK and said, you guys are just great. He said, the alliance is precious. Told the Koreans, you know, please, you know, you can criticize the US, but calm it down and stuff like that. So this ended the main protest. And within a year or so, the polls started showing that uh, anti-Americanism to be going way down. And in part, that's because uh, the focus was now uh, not on um, pretend to be able to forecast the future. I hope we never see anything like we've seen, we saw in 1999, 2002. <clears throat> I think one reason we probably won't is because Koreans today are much, much more cosmopolitan than they were. In, I, I've been stunned to come back and live here this year after being away for 10 years and how much progress Koreans have made. And, and, how much, and, and how much more cosmopolitan and knowledgeable they are. I mean, it's because they, they, you know, when I first came here, they weren't allowed to tour. And now Koreans travel all over the world. They're the most plugged in in the world. They have more PhDs than any population in the world. So I'm less worried about Koreans today than I am about my own people. 
And then I compare that, you know, with what some of the things Donald Trump has said uh, and some of the policy decisions he's made that are, affect South Korea, and it's like very little coming publicly from the South Koreans. And I think it's because, I, this is a headline I gave the Washington Post, they worry he's kind of nuts. <laughs> they don't know exactly what he's going to do, and they figure that protesting is not going to help, it just make him set him off again. So everybody's, the media, the government officials, uh, think tank people, everybody is being extraordinarily reticent about some of these outrageous things that he's saying and doing. And it reminded me of China over the past decade or two, and especially with the Thad Department. Some of the things the Chinese have done to the South Koreans, I just, just imagine if the U.S. Had, I mean, it's inconceivable. And why? And I think it's because the, and I don't mean this to be critical, it's kind of common sense. South Koreans look at China and say, this is an enormous, huge country next door, and they're not going to listen to us. And if we protest, it's just going to make it worse. So we better keep our head low. I think. That, that is still the situation. I know uh, from seven months here now that uh, the way that China has punished South Korea over the American bad deployment here has had a profound impact on the elite thinking and I would guess on many ordinary Koreans and the way that, that they look at China and say, what does China really mean to us? I was, by the way, I just got back from Beijing this afternoon. <coughs> And we talked with some think tank people there. And I didn't want to get in a fight with them about that because I feel sort of like the South Koreans about it. But I said, you know, I've been living here, and you really cost yourself with uh, the South Koreans and all of this. By the way, I, I'm not very good with arithmetic, but I'm pretty sure that in dollar terms, the Chinese have already cost the South Koreans more in one year of economic retribution over them allowing the Americans to deploy a THAAD unit to defend against North Korea's missiles than the sanctions value amount of the Chinese sanctions against North Korea for having those missiles for the past 10 years. Uh, it's pretty outrageous. But, so, you know, to answer your question, not yet. But uh, I think probably more important, if the Chinese continue this kind of crazy, uh, outrageous approach, that um, it, it will have, it will take the, the the glacier or the iceberg or something and start moving it uh, or the aircraft carrier, the aircraft carrier of the Korean state away from China. So far, Koreans have just looked only at the opportunities China has offered and <coughs> have not thought much about the risk, and now they're thinking about the risk. So I think we may see more of you know, Korean investment leaving China and going to other places, and things like that for, for the mid to long term. Uh, somewhat following up on your last response, uh, do you think that, that there could be sort of an anti-American reaction to all the pressure that's being placed on the uh, President Moon's administration uh, to uh, to uh, a rather tough line vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, and uh, how how long will how, how will his popularity ratings bear up uh, if this pressure increases? Uh, right now, we think it, it sort of looks like a, a leftist-led reaction, but could it, get it become a broader reaction of the sort that you've described in previous years? It, it's a good question, Don, and I've been trying to think about it myself. Um, I, I think I, I don't think we can know yet. I think it depends so much about what President Trump will eventually say and do, and then of course it depends also fundamentally on what President Kim will do. And I, I, I guess if I sat down uh, maybe with you or some others over a beer later, we could come out with some scenarios in which you know South Koreans could say uh, we can't rely on the United States anymore. Um, for, for various reasons. Uh, we're not there yet. And in fact, one of the things that surprised me on coming back here um, is how I think Koreans are clinging even closer to the U.S. now than they were before because 
they see that, you know, maybe as difficult as the U.S. can be with them sometimes, that China, Russia, North Korea, and, and from their perspective, Japan, are even worse. Um, and I think that's why I, I, I would guess that President Moon feels pretty conflicted uh, and, and feels really sandwiched between <clears throat> what he would like to do, which is probably try to dialogue more and give the North Koreans more humanitarian aid, at least initially, uh, and what President Trump is trying to do, which is a 100% focus on pressure until the North Koreans are willing to negotiate seriously. Um, so I'm sure there are some significant tensions in the official relationship, but, but uh, both sides are, I'm happy to say, are uh, doing a pretty good job of trying to keep those private. Um, but it will depend on what happens in the future, uh, whether or not that will remain the case. Oh, um, yeah, so I, I was going to ask, um, kind of going back to uh, 2002 with the height of the anti-American protests um, and having Kim Dae-jung and Nobi Han as the president, was there any discussion with the U.S. Uh, embassy or on the South Korean side about having a referendum about the U.S. troop presence? Because it seems like it, that was kind of the root cause of the, the anger of the U.S., um, then it seems like that would have been good cover both from our end to say, like, well, do you really want us here or yeah, for them as well? It, that's a very interesting question. And I, I briefly discuss it at the end of the book. But uh, one of the reasons the protests suddenly went down so much, uh, in addition to the steps that President Noe took after he was elected, was the then U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld had this plan to be able to move U.S. forces anywhere in the world, anywhere else in the world, at a moment's notice. And he knew he couldn't do that with South Korea. Forces, U.S. forces in South Korea, because the South Koreans would be worried if U.S. forces suddenly left and weren't there to help in, in a contingency. <coughs> but so, so Donald Rumsfeld made plans to start reducing significantly what few American forces we still had then. And uh, we informed President No confidentially. And he was very, very concerned about this uh, because I think he understood that he would be blamed by the Korean people if the Americans started withdrawing the troops. Because, you know, even though the feelings then were still very raw against the U.S. and especially U.S. forces Korea, Koreans didn't really, most Koreans didn't really want those forces to go. So, yeah, if we had done, if we had said, okay, if you don't want it, we, we're willing, you know, if you have a, an opinion for all and it shows you want us to go, we'll go. Uh, that would have probably, you know, uh, I mean, that we would never have done that for various reasons. But what had the same effect was when Don Rumsfeld actually started withdrawing troops. And it caused a panic here in South Korea uh, <coughs> across the spectrum. So last question. This is about, uh, thank you for your interesting and informative talk. I have a question concerning uh, U.S. ambassador to Korea. I think Koreans were very pleased uh, and surprised when uh, Ambassador Catherine Stevens was appointed to Korea, followed by uh, Ambassador Sung Kim. And I, I understand now that uh, Victor Cha has a nominated to uh, the ambassador to Korea. Well, I, I don't have inside information, but what I have heard is that he is the choice to become the next ambassador, but um, it has not been announced. And um, I gather that you know they're doing the routine security check, which can take some time. I, I think the, the uh, many Koreans are very pleased uh, that the uh, U.S. government is paying attention to appoint ambassadors uh, who are uh, who have some connections to Korea or Korean parents, and I think the, this will promote the relationship and then perhaps ameliorate the perhaps uh, some anti-U.S. Uh, feelings. No? And, and I think it's a good step. Uh, and so, having said that, do you, uh, have you uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, well, some uh, difficulties in having uh, 
uh, ambassadors who were across Korea uh, performing their job as ambassadors to Korea. So different things. You mean having Korean Americans as ambassadors? Or is that yeah, Korean Americans who are even uh, more ties to Korea than uh, oh. Stevens. Uh, no, um, I mean, you know, ideally an American ambassador here would have some significant knowledge and experience in Korea. Um, so that, that has almost always been a positive thing. I, for example, Kathy, a friend of mine, and I think she, she was uh, liked uh, by the Korean people probably more than any American ambassador. And so that's worked very well. There was some controversy decades ago uh, in the United States about appointing people to ambassadorial positions uh, uh, in the countries of their heritage. Uh, but So when I first came here in 79, we had our first Korean-American uh, officer, uh, head of the, the science officer, uh, a very nice lady. Uh, and she did a great job, and you know, it's just the flow of things. Uh, so now I, I would guess a significant percentage of American officers at the uh, uh, Korean, at the American Embassy here are Korean Americans. I mean, frankly, because many of them, you know, have at least some Korean language and and are comfortable with the culture already. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of a lazy man's way to uh, to have expertise in the State Department, especially, but also in other agencies. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it's very troubling that um, that the Trump administration can't get itself organized. Uh, it's not just Korea, as you probably know. Most countries in the world that had political appointees as ambassadors still don't have American ambassadors there. Unfortunately, uh, well, by way of contrast, we do have American ambassadors already in Tokyo and Beijing. So I can see where the Koreans would be kind of upset uh, that, that we still don't have an ambassador here. And it may take, you know, still several months before uh, someone is appointed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, just one afterward. Uh, I, I would, um, that book that I've written is far from perfect. Uh, there are errors in both the English and the Korean versions. Uh, if you see errors of fact, or interpretation, translation, or uh, any suggestions, uh, you know, uh, whenever they, if they, if they ever sell out, <laughs> we'll try to publish a corrected version. Uh, you can reach me at any time uh, with this simple email address, straub at yahoo.com. Thank you.